Thank you very much, John. It's always a pleasure to listen to Carlos and his wise, very wise words. And uh, first of all, a very good morning, um, colleague Carlos, ministers, um, distinguished participants, and, and colleagues. When Carlos asked me to participate during this, I immediately grabbed the, the opportunity. And one of the main reasons was that I have ocean governance very, very much at heart. And this is one of the things that I really want to turn around in Digimare, which has got about 80% of its effort on just fishing and just some 20% on ocean governance. And I really think that should be turned the other way, uh, the other way around. And considering that our planet consists of 70% of water, I really feel that we've paid very little attention to the opportunities in our oceans. But talking about opportunities, we have also to talk about responsibilities. We do have economic opportunities, but we also have environmental <laughs> responsibilities. But here I feel that I am talking to the converted because at the end of the day I feel that we are all here because we all believe in both the opportunities and the responsibilities we have towards the, the oceans. And following on after my fellow commissioner Carlos, it is a great opportunity for me to address this important conference, as I already said, and to add the perspectives of my own portfolio, mainly the portfolio of the environment, maritime efforts, and as I said, fisheries. Carlos mentioned research, and when I think of research and the sea, the first thing that comes to my mind is the research vessel Calypso. I don't know whether you do remember the research vessel Calypso. It was a former minesweeper that Jacques Cousteau bought in Malta, the island where I come from, way back in 1950. And over a decade following that purchase, some 150 television ocean documentaries brought the excitement of the bottom of the oceans and the bottom of the seas and the creatures living there right into our living rooms all over the world. And I like to think that this fascination for the ocean generated by Cousteau and those that followed him has helped bring us to this point today. Cousteau's message was always one of universality. The oceans belong to all of us. And by definition, their protection becomes our shared responsibility as well. What is so encouraging about today's conference is that it shows how much greater our capacity is to deliver on that responsibility. This afternoon and tomorrow, following on from this welcome session, you will be hearing from our American and Canadian partners about their perspectives as well and the projects that will implement the Galway Statement. So, in the time allotted to me, I would like to draw your attention to the many ramifications of your research for each of the policy areas that I cover. I will only touch on a little bit on fisheries and blue economy, marine litter, coastal tourism, and the Arctic protection. I am extremely motivated to ensure that our cooperation, as Carlos said, becomes a global gold standard. Ocean governance will be high on my agenda throughout my mandate this year, my mandate, and beyond. And I will consult widely with actors in the sector from right across the EU. I hope that together we will identify how to progress and how to move forward in the best interest of our oceans. The World Ocean Summit in Lisbon in June will be a major milestone in this process. Through the activities we have planned, I think we can build an impressive track record. I am confident 
that when we attend next October's conference on our oceans in Chile, we will also be closer to a model that can be of inspiration to other actors across other oceans. And here let me add that more importantly, we, the Commission, we stand ready to assist any efforts to turn inspiration into action. The Galway Statement perfectly complements the Commission's maritime strategy for the Atlantic area. Regarding fisheries, we have made science the basis of all our management decisions. Similarly, our environmental objective of good water status by 2020 cannot be achieved without science. But one cannot talk of science without linking it to research. There is no doubt that science and research contribute in a fundamental way to the work of both my portfolios. But for the years ahead, I see a need for research to do even more. It not only has to be mainstreamed into policy making, it has to come upstream of policy making. The earlier we get the relevant information and the earlier we identify the emerging trends, the more information our policy making will have. It is only through a science-based approach that we can best respond to some of our global challenges. For example, how do we stop overfishing? Can we find a technology that gives us an accurate check on where the vessels go and what they catch? Can this be done in an unobtrusive and cheap way? How can we further develop sustainable practices in aquaculture? And how can we optimize machinery to work in water so as to bring the cost down for tidal and wave energy? For 30 years straight, the cost of solar energy each year has come down by 10% and wind by 5%. Can we do the same with ocean energy? We are looking to science to answer these and many more questions in areas such as ocean governance, biodiversity, and in the fight against ocean pollution and the decline in fish stocks, and this not only in the Atlantic. Also, the blue economy is developing fast. Of course, development is fastest where stability and certainty are strongest. Unfortunately, with ocean energy, some investors have hesitated because that st stability was lacking. Industry leaders cannot afford to wait indefinitely to be able to take strategic decisions. Investors expect the best business environment Scientists need to look for potential markets and speak to companies that can turn their ideas into new services and new products. If research works in this manner, it will not only facilitate the opportunities for blue and green growth, but it will also ensure its own long-term sustainability. Apart from opportunities, Oceans also present us with problems of our own creation. And one of the biggest ocean challenges of our time is how to resolve the problem of marine litter. Every year, millions and millions of tons of marine litter, largely plastics, pose all sorts of risks to our oceans and to their biodiversity. This is more than an urgent matter that research can help on. And some of us cannot, still cannot imagine the scale of, of these problems. Some of us, when you talk about oceans and continents of marine litter, they, they imagine some plastic material floating at, on the surface, not realizing that that litter goes at times down to 25 30 meters below the surface. It is predicted that unless we do something about it, in a few years' time, 
For every three tons of fish, we will have one ton of marine litter. And that if that is not a problem, that then I don't know what problems really are. And now is a good time as ever because the renewed EU circular economy initiative will also address the reduction of this marine litter. And hopefully this will in turn stimulate action plans again lit against litter within the regional sea conventions. But hand in hand with this effort on reduction, we need research to throw some light as to how the already existing litter can be effectively dealt with. Carlos mentioned Boyan Slat, and, uh, who proposed a machine for catching the plastic in the ocean. Will Boyan's machine work? These are the kind of answers we need to get. Again, I would like to go back to the word stability. The Circular Economy Initiative will provide the much needed legislative stability to encourage investors who see the economic potential of tackling such problems. Another area that impacts on my portfolio is coastal tourism. This is a sector that has been relatively resilient during the most critical times during the crisis years, and a sector which is responsible for about half the sea-related jobs in coastal areas. We are still counting, but it is certainly more than one and a half million jobs. UNESCO reckons that 40% of tourism is nature and culture driven. We need to do what we can to maintain and increase the attraction of our coasts. Research can help here too in a number of ways. For instance, by helping us to map, preserve and present the ocean terrain, not to mention the valuable archaeological remains that have been submerged by a sea that has risen about 120 meters since the last ice age. Carlos also mentioned the Arctic, and we also urgently need to know more about ocean warming and acidification linked to climate change. It was very wise to include in the remit of the Galway Statement the critical interlink between the Atlantic Ocean and the portion of it bordering the Arctic. The coupled North Atlantic Arctic systems are crucial for the future of Europe and North America. In conclusion, research into how the Atlantic is developing and how we can use its potential needs cooperation from both East and West. Since the signing of the Galway Statement just two years ago, the Transatlantic Ocean Research Alliance has already proved its worth in delivering practical and concrete scientific cooperation. I was impressed to hear that the Alliance has influenced the US Atlantic Research Agenda and that several US agencies, including the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, have drawn up an international science plan. This will certainly help to have a budget focus on Atlantic research in the US and allow for alignment with our own Horizon 2020 agenda. I am equally impressed by the coordination effort underway in Canada via the Galway Marine Working Group, which should also give better alignment. To conclude, what I would wish for in the coming years is that we continue to foster ways that best help research to tackle a number of challenges, some of which I have mentioned. Right now, in celebration, symbolically, the second birthday of the Galway Statement, a few weeks from now, I wish all involved a very successful conference. We are thinking and acting strategically and in a spirit of real cooperation. I am proud of our position as global leaders. I look forward to 2015 being a year where we continue to develop and where we continue to lead. 
I fervently support my colleague Carlos and hope that our actions and our cooperation in the Atlantic will soon be extended further into other regions and other areas on the EU's borders and beyond. This, I think, should be an objective to start working on straight away. After all, our responsibility does not stop at the Atlantic, but extends to all oceans and to all seas. Thank you very much, and I wish you all a very fruitful conference.